Does life have a purpose? And if it does, is there really any way that we can know what the purpose of life is? Welcome to Midweek at the Compass. My name's Jake. Great to be together with you again. Happy New Year. It's the first time that we've gotten to do this since the turn of the calendar. And I gotta say that I'm really excited to be able to do this with you again to be able to start thinking through what are some things that we can discuss together that is gonna be beneficial, that's gonna be tangible, that's gonna be real, that's going to ultimately help you on your faith journey. So I wanted to start off with just this big topic, this overarching theme, does life have a purpose, right? It's really hard for me to sit down and think about things like that. Um, I don't know if you're anything like me, but I'm a linear thinker, right? I, I like to do point A to point B, point B to point C, and then just kind of keep going on down the line like that. It's really hard for me, quite frankly, to sit down and stew about these grand topics, ones that are just nearly impossible to wrestle through, I feel like. Um, certain things that are just, well, you know, maybe it's an agree to disagree situation. Maybe there's some sort of truth that we can glean from it. Maybe it's just something where it's, I don't even know, this is gonna make my head explode. My goal today isn't to make your head explode, so I hope you can bear with me on this. But here we go. Does life have a purpose? And if it does, what is it? So if you're checking out this video, I hope the first thing that you're going to be thinking through is the fact that, yeah, life does have a purpose. But you know what? There are gonna be some people that are going to say, I don't think life has a purpose. I don't think there is anything behind what's going on here. That really we're just a speck of dust in time. We're here for a little while, we're gone later, and quite frankly, it's all randomness and chance. And quite frankly, there are parts of that that sound kind of appealing in some ways, right? Uh, it puts a lot of pressure to not be on yourself. It gives you the thought of, okay, well, I'm just here and then I'm not, and we'll just go on with our day. Um, to me, that just kind of brushes past the point. If you're there, I want to just say thanks for being here with us. Thanks for pondering uh, whether that's the position that you want to leave with or if that's something that you want to keep thinking through. Um, I'm not going to pressure you one way or another. I would just encourage you and I would love for you to stick around and let me know your thoughts on this as we keep going. But you know, there are other ends of what the purpose of life could look like for you. For some people, it might just be survival. You know, I was reading this opinion piece from NPR from back in like 2013. And more or less, all it says is the opinion of this writer is that the only difference between living and not living is the desire for survival, right? Non-living things, rocks, stars, whatever the case might be. Uh, this author would argue that the only thing that's really different about us is that as humans, we have this innate desire to survive. Nothing else matters. It's survival of the fittest if you want to go that direction with it. There's this aspect of, you know what, I'm going to try my best, but really all I want to do is make it through another day. And there are days, again, where that also kind of sounds appealing. Um, my wife and I have had a difficult couple of days with our kids. Uh, and quite frankly, survival just sounds like a good thing. And it seems like what we're dealing with, it seems like that could be the purpose of life is just to make by, to get to another day. But personally, when I think about that, that it's all just about survival, it's a little depressing in some ways. For me, I feel like there's gotta be something more than just trying to make it to the next day. So what are some other options that life could be about? Some people would say that it's about procreating, about having a piece of you live on in someone else. It could be about having kids, about multiplying. It could be about multiplying your impact. Maybe that's not something you're doing through having children. Maybe that's something you're doing through investing in nieces and nephews, or you're investing in a mentee, or you're just looking to pour yourself into somebody else so that a bit and a piece of you is going to ultimately live on. You know, there's another school of thought that says the purpose of life really is just to make the world a better place. And quite frankly, I love the thought of that, right? With my children, I want to leave this world in better condition than I found it in. You know, I, I was part of a, a, a Christian version of Boy Scouts that was through my church growing up. It's called Royal Rangers. 
And we would go camping multiple times a year. And the biggest thing they would always tell us about the campground is you want to find, leave it in better condition than you found it in. And I want to do that the same for my kids. But that one's really hard for me to wrestle through too, right? I was a chemistry major in college. I studied these laws of entropy that say that everything is going to move from a state of order to disorder. So if I'm thinking about that, part of me is like, well, if I want the world to be a better, a better place, that's kind of already a lost cause. Because the only thing that's going to happen is that it's going to go towards more disorder. You know, there's a lot of things that are set up to try and make the world a better place. One of the easy examples with everything going on right now is politics. There is something about being affiliated with a political entity, a side of the aisle, whatever way you want to look at it that works, that they're trying to make the world a better place for the people that think like them. And that's the other end that I struggle with for if the purpose of life is just to make the world a better place, what if I'm making the world a better place for me and my people, but I'm not making the world a better place for you? We've seen over the course of the summer of 2020 that play out in real time with just racial tension. It's been very palpable. There are things that are in our system that are the ways that I've been brought up. There are things that are around me that are kind of tailored to me. And if I'm sitting here from this position, I've got to be honest, I like at times when things are tailored to me. I think you would probably say the same thing. But if my goal is to make the world a better place, but it's not making the world a better place for you, it's only making the world a better place for me, then what's the definition of a better place? To me, that makes it really hard to stomach that the purpose of life is just to make it better. You know, there's one other school of thought that just says, my goal in life, the purpose of my life is really just to be happy. I just wanna feel good. I wanna smile. I wanna enjoy the things that I have and the time that I have on this earth. And I love being happy. Uh, I love the fact that we get the opportunity to laugh. But happiness a lot of times just depends on an emotional state. And there are times where I don't feel happy. There are times where my kids do not allow me to feel happy. There are, well, that, let's back up. My kids don't control my emotions. I do. And even if I think I control my emotions, they can still swing wildly. So if happiness is this emotion that I'm supposed to have or feel at all times, and that's my purpose in life, then I feel like I should be happy all the time. And I gotta be honest, I'm not happy all the time. You know, there's this thought leader named John Maxwell. He's like a leadership guru. You might have heard of him, you might have not. He's written more books than I could care to even think about. And they're mostly all leadership based. Uh, I'd love to have you check some of his work out. I, I can't more highly recommend the things of his that I've re read, the blog posts, the podcasts that I've listened to of him. Uh, but he says that the purpose in life, or to know that at the end of the day that you've lived a successful life, is going to come down to a couple of elements. It's to grow to reach your maximum potential. And it's to sow seeds that benefit others. And those are great definitions. Quite frankly, those two things kind of summarize those four points that we just talked about already. But I'm wondering if maybe there's something more. I wonder if John Maxwell says that there's something more. I wonder if there's something more that we can glean from what is the grand purpose of life? And if there is one, how do I know what it is and how can I live it? You know, we recently had a sermon series that was given by our senior pastor here, Jeff Griffin. He's a great man. He's a great communicator. And we were going through this series called Explore God that just starts to ask these questions, these hard-hitting topics of uh, does life have a purpose? Is Jesus really God? Is Christianity too narrow? You know, and he brought up a reference to this guy in the Old Testament. He lived about 3,000 years ago, and his name was Solomon. Solomon had everything. You know, there's documentation in the Bible that would say that Solomon is the wisest man who had ever lived. And Solomon kind of wandered all over the board, but he landed somewhere concrete. Solomon, if we're to believe, was actually the wisest man in the world, the wisest man, the wisest king. What does he have to say? 
let's take a look at what Jeff talked about in terms of what Solomon said the purpose of life is. Oh, you're saying this is the most depressing sermon I have ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> All you've told us is that none of these work. What works? What is the purpose of life? It's ironic that Solomon did a full circle, leaving the religion of his youth and trying every avenue he could think of of finding purpose without God, he came right back around to a realization that we were made for our maker. Look at this. Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. This is at the very end of his record, his book. He says, Now that all has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and obey his commandments, for this is the purpose of all mankind. Interesting. Now, I'll admit that you see those words fear and obey, and they probably don't do it for you. You're like, I wouldn't have picked those words. Uh, fearing God? Here's the problem. This concept of fearing God is majorly important in the scriptures. And yet, it's so easily misunderstood. So let me try to help avoid that. Most people, when they think of fear, they think of something awful. You know, the fear of a monster. I run away from the monster, right? That's not the fear of God. The uniqueness of the fear of God is that it's a good thing. Something that makes us not run from God, but to God. I'll just give you an example. In Psalm, another Bible passage, Psalm 147, verse 11, the Lord says this, The Lord is pleased by those who fear him, those who cling to his unfailing love. What is God pleased with? People who fear him, clinging to his unfailing... Is that somebody running away from God? No. God's looking for a fear of him that results in people running to him and his love. And so what is the fear of God then? If it's a good thing that draws us to God, well, here's what it is. The fear of God is the multifaceted, intense response in the heart of people to all the attributes that make God, God. In fact, let me put this down here. The answer is God but specifically God and his attributes, I get that out of the fear of God, and his authority, I get that out of obey. But let me talk about this fear of God as a response to his attributes. We, and I'm including myself, all of us, we just don't know enough about God. Too much of who he is remains a mystery. We must grow in our connection with him and our discovery of what he's like. And let me just tell you this, according to the scriptures, when you discover more of what God is like, you're not going to be like, oh, I expected you to be more. That's disappointing. No. When you discover God's love, his passion, his power, you will be in awe. Your knees will tremble. Your heart will race. You will be like, wow. You will come alive. That's the fear of the Lord. You ever talk to a kid who just went on their first uh, roller coaster, and you ask them, what was it life like? And they're like, it was terrifying and awesome. Let's do it again. You know, that's the fear of God. Yes, it freaks you out in the most wonderful way, but you've never been so alive in awe of who God is. And so that's what we need. We need to connect with God in all of his attributes and respond with this glorious dynamic called the fear of God. And we must respond in obedience to his commands. I know obedience has a bad rap too. People are like, I can't stand Christianity. It's all about rules. Don't do this. Don't do that. Make me feel guilty about this. Make me feel guilty about that. And a lot of people reject Christianity for the very reason of rules and obedience. Friends, obedience is so misunderstood. God is not trying to ruin anybody's life. He's never given an instruction out of anything but love, desiring to craft your life into the most extraordinary option possible. Do you realize that? 
It's as if we're writing the story of our lives. We're like, God, get out. I'm in charge. I'm going to write my own story. And God comes along and says, give me the pen. I'm telling you, I'm a better writer than you are. If you'll give me the pen, I will write your story. And as you follow my lead, I will make your life beautiful. I will lead you into uh, assignments to change this world and to touch and mark people in glorious ways and to advance my cause and to fill your soul. God says, give me the pen. So we just saw, we just heard, we just maybe learned for the first time that Solomon landed on the fact that there are two key things to do to know your purpose in life and to know that you're living it out. That's to fear God and obey his commandments. And Jeff talked a lot about the attributes that we can learn from Jesus and or from God and the authority that he has when we talk about fear and obeying. I'd love to have you go to youtube.com slash the compass church. Go to our Explore God playlist. You can watch the full message there. It'd be a great opportunity to kind of refresh the examples that he gave through and more of what he walked through of what it means to fear God and what it looks like to obey him. But I would argue as well that life is better when we give God the pen, when we let him write our story. And we can do that through fear and obedience. You know, going back to that John Maxwell quote, I want to apologize to you because I intentionally left something out of what he said. You know, we talked about how John Maxwell would say that part of knowing the purpose of life and whether you've been successful at the end of the day is growing to maximize your potential. And the other aspect of sowing seeds to benefit others. But there's one key point that he put at the beginning of those. Again, linear thinker, I love when things go in order. And his first point is to know God and his will for your life. You know, that can seem really daunting. How can you know God? If he's there, if he exists, what can we do to know him? Quite frankly, we can know God because of the person of Jesus and because of what God has revealed through scripture. We're gonna talk another point in time about, is the Bible reliable? I hope you'll stick around for us for that. But ultimately, the things that we know about God, the things that are important for us to know about him, have already been revealed to us through what God has put in these 66 letters and books combined into what we call the Bible. We can know God through scripture. We can know God through conversation. But there's a second part to what he said, and to know his will. You know, for me personally, that's an area where I struggled for a long time because ever since I was in college, I associated what's God's will as being, what am I supposed to do for my career? What am I supposed to do with my life? What are the action steps of who I'm supposed to be? And I think I missed the mark personally. I think the answer is actually really simple when we hone down on it. What is God's will for your life? It's the same as God's will for my life. And that is to glorify him, to bring him honor in everything that we do, in everything we say, in everything we think. You and I were created by a creator who loves us, whose desire is for us to make much of him, to know him, and more importantly, to be known by him. Because he loves us and he transforms our lives more and more into the shape of what his will is. And that's to continue to bring him glory, to bring him honor, to love him more tangibly each and every single day. Thank you for taking a few moments to be with us here at Midweek this week. I hope this was beneficial. I hope it was encouraging for you. You know, if you loved the information that we walked through or you want to know more, I'd love for you to click the like button if you're watching us on YouTube. You can go ahead and subscribe. If you're watching us on Facebook, go ahead and toss some comments in. I'd love to have some back and forward on your thoughts. What do you think the purpose of life is? Why are you here? Why are you watching this video but grander scale? Why are you on earth? What's the point of it? Let's banter. Let's have some back and forth. Let's do it in a way that's respectful and is loving and that's going to spur some further conversations here. Look forward to being with you again next time on Midweek at the Compass.